An artist's paintbrush can have synthetic bristles or natural ones made of animal hair. Which type to use is really a matter of the artist's preference. However, painters often tend to use a natural brush for watercolors, a synthetic brush for acrylics, and either type for oils. These natural hair paintbrushes are made of red sable, which is tail hair from a species of weasel. Red sable is renowned for its softness and for spreading paint thinly and evenly. An experienced head maker performs the initial steps of making the head of the paintbrush. She unrolls and straightens out a bundle of red sable, then separates enough hairs for one brush of this size. She inserts the hairs into a metal band called a ferrule made of nickel-plated brass. She feels how they fit in the ferrule. If the fit's too tight, she removes some hairs. If it's too loose, she adds some. Brushes of different shapes require different tensions. The head maker takes the correct brass mold for the brush shape she's making and inserts the hairs all the way down into the mold cavity. She ties the roots of the hairs together with the string, then removes them from the mold. She inserts the brush head back into the ferrule, then removes the string. Next, using a template, she adjusts what's called the length out of the brush head. Length out is how far the hairs protrude from the end of the ferrule. After removing stray hairs, she aligns the end of the ferrule with the edge of the nearly one inch long template and pulls out or pushes in the hairs until their tips align with the opposite edge of the template. She completes her specialized work by suspending the assembled brush head from a rack. Another worker now fills a syringe with epoxy glue. Then, with the syringe, fills the ferrule with enough glue to submerge the hairs. Once the glue has dried overnight, another worker taps the brush head against a strip of adhesive tape to remove any short hairs that didn't adhere. She dips the hairs into a solution of starch and water and works the solution into all the hairs by massaging the head on a towel. The starch allows the hairs to be trained to a permanent shape. She makes this particular pointed shape by spinning the head, then smoothing the hairs with her fingers. The starch dries overnight, locking in the shape. To make the paintbrush handle, a worker inserts birch dowels in a pegboard, then mounts the board upside down on a dipping machine. This machine submerges the dowels in black lacquer paint. After one day of drying time, there's a second dip, part way this time in silver paint. The machine has markings to indicate how deep to dip the dowels for each color. After another day of drying time, there's a third dip, this time partway in black paint. This creates a black handle with a silver stripe. Once the last coat of black paint dries, a worker uses a pad printer to stamp lettering on the handle with quick-dry silver ink. One stamp simultaneously applies the manufacturer's name, the brush hair material, the size of the brush, and the series number. A worker glues the brush head onto the handle. Then the worker sets the brush aside for a couple of hours until the glue partially dries to a tacky state. Because the next step, crimping, would crack the fully dried hardened glue. The worker inserts the ferrule into a crimping machine, which has been loaded with a die that's the correct diameter for this brush handle. The machine crimps the ferrule tightly to the handle, attaching it permanently. Once that glue hardens, the paintbrush is finally ready. From this point onward, 
It's in the artist's hands. In the 17th and 18th centuries, most wealthy people in Europe and America had at least one finely crafted game table in the drawing room for cards and conversation after dinner. Today, game tables aren't just for the wealthy, but for anyone who enjoys this fun and functional furniture. This modern game table does double duty. Flip the game top over and it becomes a dining table. When it comes to space saving, this table's a game changer. A saw carves kiln-dried maple boards into thick strips, helped by a laser scanner so the saw can make clean and judicious cuts. An equipment operator scrutinizes the strips for knots and other defects and marks them with orange chalk. Another scanner detects the orange marks, enabling a saw to cut around the defects as it chops the strips into shorter lengths. The next worker dips one side of the strips in polyvinyl acetate, a super strong glue. The next worker arranges the strips in a specific order, alternating the grain to balance the wood's expansion and contraction forces. He clamps them tightly together and allows the glue to set. Workers sand the top and bottom and trim the sides to produce one of the rim segments. A computerized router now moves from one segment to the next as it carves slots for poker chips and drinks. It then drills holes in the sides for the wooden dowels that will be used to join the eight table segments. The segments are now ready for assembly. A worker pipes high-strength adhesive in grooves along the edges and into the dowel holes. He inserts the dowels in the holes in one side of each segment. He arranges the segments in a circular pattern and inserts the dowels in the corresponding holes. He pulls the eight rim segments tightly together with a strap clamp and leaves the glued configuration to cure overnight. This permanently bonds the table rim segments. The next day, a computerized router rounds the outside of the rim. It also trims the inside of the rim and forms a channel for the insertion of the center of the game table. The game table rim is now complete. With the rim now game side down, the next member of the team pipes more of the super adhesive into the inner channel. He inserts the dining table surface. This maple center has been precision cut to fit into the groove in the rim. Using a rubber mallet, he taps the tabletop to entrench it more firmly in the groove. He flips the tabletop back to the game side and installs 16 screws on an angle to tighten the top to the rim. The screws serve as a clamp system to hold the table center in place as the glue cures. With the center now bonded to the rim, a worker sprays a base color and then a wood stain onto both sides. This highlights the character of the wood and gives it a warm tone. A worker then applies two coats of a urethane varnish and sands the finish between the coats. Then, workers assemble a pedestal base and install a piece of laminate in a stained maple frame. This creates a storage compartment under the tabletop, as well as providing a foundation for the tabletop to sit on. The team transfers the pedestal base to the table foundation. They bolt them together, which creates the support structure for the tabletop. Back to the game tabletop, a worker installs a cloth-covered padded insert. This will serve as a smooth and cushy surface for card playing. And with that, workers finally transfer the game tabletop to the base. The games can now begin.